To know him is simple No levels through which to enter Imagine this 90 degree, or 9 degree, excuse me, I wish it was 90, 9 degree weather. But uh, we want to get right into the word of the Lord tonight. I want to go back and just briefly mention a little bit of what we had last week and then we're going to go on and we're going to do the whole chapter hopefully of my paraphrase of Ephesians chapter 5 but last week we looked at the meaning of several words flesh natural man flesh and blood and so forth and we found out that it has to do with an awareness we always were a new man so you see what would the old man be but an awareness of thinking that we were in an old man when God made mankind, he made mankind upright, the scripture says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7 and verse 29. And what God does, Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, is forever nothing can add to it or take away from it. So what could Adam have taken away from us? Only in our thinking, only in our mind did we think that as a result of the transgression in the garden, we received automatically a sinful nature or a corrupted identity. But we found out through a lot of scriptures in our previous series on our eternal identity and then this series, Original Sin versus Original Blessing, we found out that it was because man chose on his own to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I certainly believe that false concepts of religion were passed down from generation to generation, but we have believed in the past that we just automatically inherited those things from Adam. Let me change a little something and tweak a little something that I've been saying in these last two series that we have done. And that is, I've made the statement many times that we, when we came here, we came here with amnesia. Let me scratch that out now and let me change that a little bit. Because you know what? Little children, they don't worry. They don't fret. They don't have guilt, fear. They don't have condemnation. So it was not until religion began to interject into our thinking some false concepts that we then gradually began to fall asleep and have what we call that amnesia where we forgot. So it really wasn't that we came here with amnesia. It was that once we understood enough to embrace those false concepts, that's when we really began to fall asleep little by little until we came to the place to where we had that amnesia and we forgot and we believed the lie that we were in Adam, that we were corrupted, that we were, uh, you know, received the sin nature through what Adam did. Now, we looked at the word flesh and we found out that it has three meanings and one, of course, is our bodies. The other one that Paul used in Galatians especially was where he talked about a mentality of law and legalism. He called that the flesh. And then we found out that flesh is also used for all men, like he'll pour out his spirit upon all flesh or all men. And so we found out that flesh, mainly in the way Paul the Apostle used it, had to do with us receiving false concepts about being under the law, the old law, uh, false concepts of legalism and rules and regulations and so forth. So we found out that flesh is applicable to that. Then we talked last week about the natural man where the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man receives nothing from the spirit. Truth is spiritually discerned and understood. And so what is the natural man? But not a person, not a man or woman that we were, per se, but it was an awareness. Natural man is talking about living by the outward. It's talking about essential, living by the passions of, a, you know, of the flesh and so forth, the five senses. And then we went to a scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 that used the phrase flesh and blood. And we found out that the scripture says that flesh and blood cannot inherit or experience the kingdom of God. And so people have taken off on that and said, well, to experience the kingdom of God, you have to die because flesh and blood cannot experience or inherit the kingdom of God. Well, where is the kingdom of God? Well, it's within us. It comes not with observation. It's within us, and it is righteousness, peace, and joy. 
So again, flesh and blood is an awareness that we have taken on ourselves. And as long as we're in that awareness, that mentality of flesh and blood or natural thinking or fleshly thinking or legal thinking or law abiding thinking, we cannot experience, really experience the kingdom of God. Then we went further on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and we found out that something will change when we hear a message. We talked about the seventh trump, the last trump. And of course, trumpeting is a message and the seventh is the fullness, seven is fullness. So when we hear the fullness of the message, what is the fullness of the message? Well, I believe it begins by seeing there's only one power, there's only one presence, there's only one spirit, there's only one identity, there's only one nature. And so then we're changed where? We're changed in our awareness. Nowhere else do we need to change. Our bodies don't need to be changed. They may appear like they need to change, but they really do not need to change. The only thing that needs to change is between our ears. And then we went on a little further with those verses in 1 Corinthians 15. We talked about being shown a mystery. Remember, it used the word mystery, which is mysterion in the Greek, and it means a sacred secret of God. Why is it a sacred secret? Is it a secret that certain people can't receive it and only certain people can receive it? No, it's a sacred secret, meaning it has to be revealed by the Holy Spirit within us. That's what makes it a mysterion or a sacred secret. Man can't teach it to you. The Holy Spirit within has to teach it to you. And then it connected that sacred secret within a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And I shared with you one of the meanings of in a moment is when you receive a quickening of a revelation. It means with jerking motions. In a moment means with jerking motions. Isn't it true that when you get a revelation, it's like a flash? Some people call it a light bulb moment, an aha moment, because it instantaneously is revealed to you. And that's what in a moment means there. It's not talking about time, like, you know, in a moment Jesus was shown the kingdoms and so forth. It's not that meaning whatsoever. It's quick flashing revelation that comes to us. And then it says, in the twinkling of an eye, and we found out that in the twinkling of an eye, that phrase means the upward sweep of revelation. In other words, it comes from within up to our consciousness or to our awareness. Now, I've asked the question over the years many times about the twinkling of an eye. What is it in the natural that makes our eye twinkle? Well, it's when light hits it and penetrates it. And the same way as in the natural, so in the spiritual. When light, quickening, and understanding from the Holy Spirit not only hits our mind, because eye is symbolic of awareness and mind, when it not only hits it but penetrates us, that's the upward sweeper revelation. That is the twinkling that makes your eye twinkle. I can be teaching the Word of God, and a lot of times I have looked in people's faces while I was teaching, and I could see their eyes twinkle. You could see it in their eyes that something penetrated them, that they received something, something enlightened them, something was quickened within them. So in this spiritual realm, when this seventh trump, the fullness of the message that has to do with one, is revealed to us in a moment, it's the twinkling of an eye, it's the upward sweep of revelation, and what changes is between our ears. If your eye be single, it says your whole body will be full of light. I see it this way. If your eye be single, you'll see that your whole body already is full of light. And what is the eye symbolic of? It's symbolic of the awareness or the mind. So it's a message in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that causes the change between our ears. It quickens in our awareness, in our mind. The mind of Christ is brought up to our awareness and something is quickened. Now, when you study in Proverbs chapter 31, it talks there about a virtuous woman. And we may teach that at the end of this series, I'm not sure. But, but this woman, this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, I think it's rare in some translations, this rare woman, it represents, again, our feminine principle, which we know that our spirit is a masculine principle, our husband, it's Christ. And we know that our feminine principle is our awareness. It's in the feminine gender. And so this woman was very, very successful. It, it talks about her husband who was known in the gates of the city. It talks about the fact that everything she put her hands to prospered and everything was, you know, was just grand in her life simply because 
she put the right thing between her ears. She put the right thing in her awareness, and as a result, everything she touched prospered. Then we can read in the scriptures that many of the men in the Old Testament, they had wives that were barren. Well, you know what? There's a lot of wives today, wombs that are barren, spiritually speaking. You know why? Because they've received a whole lot of garbage, a whole lot of traditions of men, a whole lot of false concepts between their ears that were not the truth. So it couldn't bear. You know, I think it was Peter that talked about the mind and he likened it to a womb. Well, a womb cannot bear fruit unless a seed is deposited within us. And that womb is likened to our awareness, to our consciousness or to our awareness. Jesus then taught a parable, which I, I just love because he said, if you understand this parable, you'll understand all things. And the parable was about a sower sowing a seed. And he talked about some bringing forth 30, some 60, and some 100 fold as a result of the seed being sown into the ground. And he likened the ground to the heart slash awareness. Remember David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. Now, it always had been in him, but thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might sin, not sin against thee, that I might not have this mistaken identity is how we would interpret that uh, in the new covenant. We hide that word in our awareness. We hide it, you know, in our womb. And so it's very important for us to highly regard the womb, the woman, and that's what we're going to be talking about in Ephesians chapter 5. I'd like to get through that whole chapter and, uh, you know, give my paraphrase on that. But let me just say this. When the scripture talks in the book of Galatians chapter 5 about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, it is not telling us what to do and what to avoid doing. When it talks about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faith, temperance, and all that as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, he's not telling us, now do this. And when he talks about the works of the flesh, he's, he's not saying, now don't do this. Because listen, Paul told us not to be sin conscious, not to focus upon behavior, but be Christ conscious and focus on Christ. So here's what we see in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 18 concerning the fruit of the Spirit. It says there, if we will walk in the Spirit, will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we will walk in the Spirit, the spontaneous knee-jerk reaction of that will just be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so forth. But if we walk with carnal concepts between our ears, the natural spontaneous outflow of that will be the works of the flesh. All those works of the flesh that are listed there in Galatians chapter 5. So what Christianity has not understood for the most part is that this Christian life is to be lived by a flow. By a flow. And the key is whatever we put in our awareness will bring that flow. What does Romans 8 say, uh, tell us? It says there, to be carnally minded is death. Experiencing death. But to be spiritually minded is to experience what? Life and peace. So whatever it is, whatever our focus is, you know, where focus goes, energy flows. So whatever our focus is, if our focus, and if we have deposited that seed, and this is something that we do, we keep the garden. We put on the renewing mind. We put on the mind of Christ. Not something that our Father is just automatically going to do for us. There, that is something that we do, but we can do it with ease and in a posture of rest because that's our nature. It's just our nature to do that. And so uh, it's very important for us to understand that, again, in Galatians 5, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he's not talking about try to do this like behavior modification. Or the works of the flesh, uh, try your hardest not to do this as another form of behavior modification. No, he's just saying, walk in the Spirit, and this will be the automatic thing that will flow out of your life. Walk in the flesh, and of course we know the flesh can be law, legalism, carnal concepts, false concepts, but walk in the flesh, and then the works of the flesh will just be spontaneous and natural to flow out of a life. Now, I want to get in Ephesians chapter 5, so if you want to follow along there, I'm going to give you my paraphrase, hopefully the whole chapter there. 
And I want us to see, I do not believe that Paul the Apostle is talking about behavior. I, I just don't, I don't buy that. Even though there are terms there that if you're reading it on the surface level, like husbands love your wives, wives submit to the husband. See, if you read it on the surface level, you may think that he's giving you some do's and don'ts of marriage in the natural. But I don't believe he's talking about that. Now, don't misunderstand. I believe there are different roles in a marriage in the natural. There are different roles that the husband plays, the wife, you know, uh, plays in it. But I don't believe that's what Paul's talking about. Now, let me back up and say this. What have we been looking at in the book of Ephesians? We have been looking at the eternal perspective as Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. Again, in Ephesians chapter 1, he talked about have been blessed. And we took that back to Genesis chapter 1 when he made us in his image after his likeness and blessed us. It wasn't at the cross. The cross revealed it. The death absorbed, exposed, swallowed up the lies. Although, you know what? We can exhume those lies in our mind. We can exhume those lies in our mind. But Jesus took care of all of that. And in his resurrection, he revealed the truth of being and who we have always been. So we're going to look at this book of Ephesians, and we have been looking at it from an eternal perspective, from our eternal. We were chosen. We were saved. We were redeemed. We were blessed from before the foundation of the world. And Jesus came to reveal that unto us because we forgot it. We had that amnesia. And I shared with you how an amnesiac doesn't change his identity or his nature. He just cannot participate with his family or people like he used to participate with them. Another thing about Ephesians that we've been finding out way at the beginning of this series is that it was written to them but for us. There are some things in the scripture uh, that were written to the Jewish people, the people of Israel, and there are a lot of things that we can glean out of that, but it was real. Much of it was really written to them and for us. Now, I'm not really preterous in my understanding of some things, but I do realize that some things uh, we can apply to preterism. Some things have been fulfilled completely and totally in the New Testament. But there are still things, even though they've been fulfilled, like 70 AD and some of the other things, there are still things that we can glean out of those scriptures. So, in Ephesians chapter 5, let's begin there with verse 1. As I said, I like to try to get through the whole chapter. Uh, and then next week we can go to the last chapter that talks about the armor of God. And, of course, most people think that uh, it's to fight. But how many know well, there is no fight? There's no battle. There's nothing we have to fight. There's something we need to realize. So let's begin there in Ephesians 5, beginning with verse 1. The King James says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now, you know, you could read that. If you just read that on a surface level, you could read that and think dual, duality, follow. Because when you normally follow someone, it's two. You know, uh, there's a scripture in one of the little John books uh, that says that when we see him, we'll be like him. I don't exactly like the word like because it's like those two chairs are alike, but they're separate. So what is he saying here where he says in the King James, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children? This is what I hear. This is my paraphrase. It's very simple. Just live from the inside out. Live from the inside out. Now there may be a following within you. Certainly our feminine principle of our being, our awareness, does and needs to follow our husband, the Christ within us. In that sense, you could use follow. But many times when we see that verse in the past, at least, we've you know, right away thought of where we are following him in a dual sense. So I just say in my paraphrase, just live from the inside out. Just live from the inside out. Verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, this is the King James, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. My paraphrase is this, and let me read verse 1 with verse 2 of my paraphrase. Verse 1, live from the inside out. 
For example, verse 2, for example, as you realize God's love for you in giving himself to absorb the lies you have believed and how his resurrection revealed the truth of meaning unto you, it is so you can and are enabled to live from the inside out. That's what enables us to live from the inside out. When we know God's love, when we know that he gave himself, as it says in the King James, as an offering and a sacrifice of a sweet-smelling savor, when we really begin to get revelation of the love of the Father for us, then we can begin to love from the inside out. We can begin to rest. We can begin to live from the inside out. We can begin to love from the inside out everyone that we come in contact with. Verse 3 in the King James. But fornication and all uncleanness. Now let me stop and just say this. If Paul the Apostle did not want us to be sin conscious, and we know that he didn't, why would he use words like uncleanness and fornication and covetousness? <coughs> Do you think he was talking about, you know, that he was shifting from be a follower of Christ or live from the inside out, and all of a sudden now he's going to shift to fornication? And uncleanness, he's going to, you know, change horses in the middle of the stream? Absolutely no. These terms, I believe, are for us to identify as spiritual. So listen to verse 3, first of all, in the King James. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named amongst you as becometh saints. So my paraphrase is, as you live from the inside out, you will have no other gods before you. And I could add, no God the devil, no God sickness, no God lack, no God poverty, no God anything. <clears throat> so as you live from the inside out, sin, that's, that's religious fornication. As you live from the inside out, you will have no other gods before you. You will be walking free from spot or blemish, the uncleanness. You will be walking free from spot or blemish. And you will not cover, covet or desire what someone else has because you will realize that you have all as well. I remember when I was teaching on living out of our spiritual resources, I said many times to the people, you know what? When you see a person that maybe has a greater manifestation in their life, don't get jealous because you have the same allness of the Father within you. You have the same allness of the Father. Instead, rejoice, you know, with those that rejoice. Now, verse 4 then says in the King James, neither filthiness. Now, he's not talking about filthiness, nor foolish talking. He's not talking about, you know, telling dirty jokes. I mean, obviously, I'm not advocating that, but that's not what he's talking about here. So, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So my paraphrase is, you will have only pure words of spirit and life flow out of the abundance of your heart naturally. And your attitude of gratitude will clothe you well as you live from the inside out. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about there. I'm not talking about behavior modification or be sure you, you're, you're not filthy. I mean, change your clothes once in a while and take a bath and don't tell dirty jokes. He's not talking about any of that. He's talking spiritual. Verse 5, King James, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Well, that can be right if you're interpreting that on the surface level, in a natural sense, because everyone has within them the kingdom of God. Everyone has the allness of the Father, regardless of their behavior. So my paraphrase of verse 5 is, For you have come to realize and know that only the pure in heart shall see God within and experience the kingdom of his dear Son. To the pure all things are pure, so continually be filling your heart with this eternal reality. Verse 6, and the King James says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Boy, that sounds kind of scary, right? If you just read that on the surface level, don't let any man deceive you with vain words. If you do, the wrath of God is going to come upon the children of disobedience. Well, how many know tonight the wrath of God, it's orgy in the Greek, orge in the Greek, which means 
God's love and longing and passion for mankind. So my paraphrase is, do not receive any word which does not exalt Christ in you and as your life, lest you become your own worst enemy, bringing upon yourself that which has to be burned up in the passion and the fire of his love. Verse 7, be not ye therefore partakers with them. My paraphrase is, do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as most do, but separate yourselves from that way of life or that source of living. Of course, we know that the tree of life is the tree. We are that tree. Actually, we are the tree of life. Not only do we partake of the tree of life, we are. It says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, so we are the tree of life. So we must eat of ourselves, talking about what? Our true identity, our true nature. Those things that bespeak of who God made us originally in the beginning, before time, before the foundation of the world. Verse 8 in the King James, For ye were sometime darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now that sounds like that, you know, as we have taught in the past, and many still do, that Jesus went to the cross to take us out of an Adamic nature, take us out of Adam and put us into himself, put us into Christ. That kind of is what that sounds like. Let me read it again in the King James. For ye were sometime darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. My paraphrase is, just because you were at one time ignorant of your eternal identity, realize now that you have always been one in and as Christ. Then you will walk in that reality effortlessly. See, it all has to do with what's between our ears. The awareness is what? It's the projector. And depending on whether we put life or death in our projector, in our awareness, it will project that out in the experience of our life. And that's, you know, as a man thinks in his heart, awareness, so is he. Out of the heart, awareness flow the issues of life, the experiences of life. Verse 9 in the King James, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. My paraphrase is, always remember that living from the inside out bears the fruit of spiritual goodness, being right, and always speaking life unto those that you come in contact with. Verse 10, I could have read those together, and let me back up there and read 9 and 10 together, the King James. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So let me read my prayer phrase of those two together. Always remember that living from the inside out bears the fruit of spiritual goodness, being right, and always speaking life unto those you come in contact with. That is the gauge, that is the gauge of a life lived as Christ in the earth. That is the gauge of a life lived as Christ in the earth. Verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. My paraphrase is, be sure that you only feed on the tree of life, and when tempted to judge by appearances, remind yourself that living from the inside out is living out of your eternal identity, redemption, salvation, and inheritance. Oh, it's going to get gooder and gooder here when we get to the men and the women here, the husbands and the wives. Verse 12, listen, King James in verse 12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. My paraphrase is, You will reinforce this inward living by speaking to yourself only that which proceeds from the tree of who you truly are and not what the majority are living from. Verse 13, King James, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. My paraphrase is, the light will eventually expose the source of their lifestyle and they will be corrected, but mind your own spiritual business. And that's what we need to do. Let God, you know, deal with others. We just present the truth. You know, we just present the truth and we're not Holy Spirit Junior. I can't make it a reality. I can't quicken it within you, nor can you quicken the truth within me. 
But what that says there is the light will eventually expose the source of everyone's lifestyle, and they'll be corrected. Remember, Paul talked about burning up the wood, the hay, and the stubble. What is that? The word is a fire. God is a consuming fire within us. The word is a fire. We could connect that to the lake of fire. What is a lake of fire? So many people are confused about that. I ask them many times, okay, well, if you want to know what a lake of fire is, what is a lake in the natural? It's a body of water. So what is a lake of fire spiritually? It's a body of people that are one with the fire. And as we present the truth, guess what? It burns up all the false concepts and the false ideas and all those things that we were taught religiously. Verse 14 in the King James, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. My paraphrase is, In time all men will wake up and see the light and come to experience their eternal identity just as you have. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. My paraphrase is, so be sure that your lifestyle expresses the wisdom of Christ rather than living as one who thinks his life is his own and that he can just do and live any old way he wants to. See, the scripture that says we were bought with a price, we're not our own, we're bought with a price, people use that negatively. Well, bless God, you know, you were bought with a price. Well, thank God we were bought with a price. And him buying us with a price and showing us that we're not our own shows us that we've always been the Lord from heaven, as we read last week. We've always been Christ in the earth. And that's what that's talking about. Verse 16 then goes on to say in the King James, redeeming the time because the days are evil. My paraphrase is, you will then be using your time wisely for the good of mankind, being an example unto them. So let me back up again to verse 15 and read 15 and 16 together. King James says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So my paraphrase of both of those are, So be sure that your, life to, your lifestyle expresses the wisdom of Christ rather than living as one who thinks his life is his own and he can live as he so desires, you will then be using your time wisely for the good of mankind being an example unto them. That's the good news. That's the good news. Verse 17, wherefore, this is King James, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. My paraphrase is, know that this is the will, the purpose, and the plan of God for you to conduct your life from within. And then listen to verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now we know that Paul is not talking about not getting drunk on wine. He's not talking about that whatsoever. He's talking spiritual in spiritual terms here. So listen to this where it says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And you know the word filled when it talks about they were filled with the Spirit? It's pleroma in the Greek. Filled means to be controlled by. So what Paul was saying in the King James is don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be controlled by the Spirit. Now my paraphrase, do not go too far to the extreme in anything that you do. Realize that the key in that is to be controlled by the inner life which you are. Now, I really think that what Paul was saying here was, you know, there was a time in my life that I loved the anointing. I mean, I still love the anointing, but I love to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, and I still operate as the Spirit leads. There was a time that I loved the gold dust, and I still would love gold dust. There were times that, you know, we love the emotions, you know, of gathering together with the body. But you know what? We got to the place to where we thought the anointing wasn't there or the Lord wasn't present if we didn't have that. So that's what that's saying. Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be controlled by the Spirit. In other words, whatever the Spirit wants is proof that the Spirit is there or that the presence is there. So don't do anything, my paraphrase is, don't go too far 
to the extreme in anything that you do, just simply realize that the key is, are we controlled by the Spirit? Now, I'm not speaking against any of those other things, because I love all of that stuff. Love all of that stuff. But when we think we have to have that, then we've got a problem. Or the Spirit wasn't with us, because, you know, someone didn't fall on the floor. Someone wasn't slain, or... Or someone, you know, there wasn't any gold dust. And you know what? In our church in Portland, we had all of that stuff and still once in a while do. I remember a time when gold dust was on people. Someone says, well, that's crazy. That couldn't have been the Lord. Well, it was. It was the anointing of the Lord. There were manifestations there. But you know what? The Lord is wanting to bring us to the place to where, regardless if there's ever any manifestation, we still know that we know that we know that we know that he is all in all, in us, through us, and as us. And then we're going to be tapping into what Jesus talked about when he said, these things shall you do and greater. It's not just going to be fruit here today and gone tomorrow, but it's going to be fruit that remains. And I'm convinced that the whole creation, Romans 8, that is on tiptoe looking for the manifestation of the sons of God, they're looking for a people that know who the Father is as them and they're seeing consistent fruit that is being born in their life and what is it going to take there's not going to be fruit bearing if the seed isn't sown and the seed has to be sown from the mind of Christ the very depth of our being has to be sown in our conscious awareness in our awareness just being conscious of the truth verse 19 in the King James says speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, my paraphrase of that is, realizing that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, make up your own songs of praise and sing spontaneously by the Spirit unto yourself, no matter how dumb it sounds. You ever done that? You just, you know, walk into the house and you just make up your own songs or you're in the shower or taking a bath and you make up your own songs and to someone it might sound just really dumb, but to you, you're making melody in your heart. You're just singing by the Spirit, spontaneously by the Spirit. Verse 20, the King James, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. My paraphrase is always verbalize your thankfulness to the Lord and to others for that which has eternally been yours from before time began when God said, let us become man in our image and after our likeness and let us bless them with all things. Verse 21, King James, submitting yourselves. Now, here's that scripture. See, because when we talk about the husband and wife, you know, the wife needs to submit to the husband and reverence the husband and the husband needs to, to love. Here's the scripture that says we're to submit one to another. So when we get to the husband and the wife and the wife submitting to the husband, we have to realize that he's talking in spiritual terms. Not in the natural. Not the wife he has to submit, you know, and the husband has to make sure he's loving. Here it says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So when Paul talks about husband and wife, what I'm saying is he has to be talking in spiritual terms, not natural terms. Now, my paraphrase then of verse 21, which says in the King James, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. My paraphrase is, when you live from this eternal life within you, you will see yourself as having the same life as all men, and you will deem them with importance and respect that life as being the same life as your life, reverencing it as the Christ life. You'll see the life of all mankind. When you love someone else, you're loving yourself. You'll see it just as one life. Now, verse 22, we now get into the husband and wifey stuff, which, as I said, is he's not talking about literal, natural marriage. Again, there are roles in the home. Don't misunderstand. There are roles in marriage, of course, but I think he's talking about something, something a little deeper than that. And I believe once we get this priority in line and we're living out of the spirit, then there's no problem the wife submitting. There's no problem the husband loving. There's no problem the wife, you know, reverencing the husband. That's not an issue whatsoever. 
But that's not what Paul's talking about. Now listen to verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, again, the masculine part or masculine principle of our being is Christ, our husband, our spirit. The feminine principle is our awareness, that virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. So let me give you my paraphrase of verse 22. Give your heart awareness, that feminine part of you, unto the masculine spirit within you. Submit that awareness to the Christ within you. That's what he's talking about. And later he calls it a mystery. Well, what kind of a mystery would it be if it's just the husband, you know, loving the wife and the wife he's submitting to the husband? That's not much of a mystery. So you can see right there, once we get to that verse, that he's talking about something more than that. All right, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So my paraphrase is, put your spirit first. That is how you will experience this eternal salvation, redemption, and inheritance. Let your true husband, Christ, nourish the wife of your heart awareness in you. That's what he's talking about. Verse 24 in King James, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. My paraphrase is, even as you allow your awareness to be full of the mind of Christ in your spirit, will you enjoy the peace, protection, and provision which is yours and has always been a part of your inner life. Verse 25 in the King James, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, I'm all for the husband loving the wife. I'm all for all of this. There, there are roles, but again, that is not what Paul's talking about. So verse 25, my paraphrase, where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. My paraphrase is, because of the love of the Father, this inward marriage and union conceives within us the spontaneous walk, not of duty, but of a ceaseless flow of love and action. I love that. Verse 26 in the King James, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, is that a husband in the natural that sanctifies and cleanses the wifey with the washing of the word? I think not. Something's wrong with that. So verse 26 in the King James, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. My paraphrase is, revealing that we are set apart and spotless as the Word has shown us and revealed unto us. See, we're a church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. How do we know that? Because our husband Christ has shown us that. And what does that do? That cleanses us between our ears. And so then that which can flow out of us is pure. It's Him. Verse 27, King James, that He might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having. Remember the Shulamite? The king says, oh, darling, you're, you're, there's no spot in thee. Well, she probably had a whole bunch of spots in the appearance realm, but no, there's no spot in you. He was speaking. He was trying to love her into the, the union, you see, that he might present it. King James says, verse 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. My paraphrase says, and that he sees us as a bright and shining beacon of light with nothing missing or nothing broken whatsoever, but as him in the earth. That's how he sees us. No spot, no blemish, no wrinkle. Why would he tell us not to judge by appearances? And then our Father, Spirit within us, is condemning us and judging us by the appearance realm? Verse 28 in the King James, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. My paraphrase is, so lo listen, so love yourself into this experiential union. Now, here's the thing. When a man is courting a woman, and he's thinking in his mind, I want to marry that gal someday. 
He'll bring her roses. He'll bring her candy. He'll bring her all kind of gifts, right? So as in the natural, so in the spiritual. And this is what verse 28 is really saying. My paraphrase, love yourself into this experiential union. Don't condemn yourself. Don't even be hard on yourself. Gift yourself with this extravagant love affair. Now, you know what? We're just too darn hard on ourselves. Always condemning ourselves. Well, I can't do this, can't do the other. We need to love ourselves into this experiential union. And who has taught us to be hard on ourselves? Religion. Who's taught us to condemn ourselves? Religion. Who's taught us, well, you can't do this, you can't do the other? You lack, you're limited. Who's taught us that? But religion has taught us that. So what Paul is saying here in verse 28 by the Spirit is, so ought men to love their wives. So we need to allow our Christ within us, the Spirit, to love that feminine part of us into the experiential union. And as we do, we are gifting ourselves with this extravagant love affair. Verse 29 in the King James, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. My paraphrase is, it is normal to love yourself. That's our nature. Hello? It should be normal to love ourselves. But because religion has taught us to hate ourselves, almost, you know, so it is normal to love yourself into this experience because that is your eternal nature. No one really hates themselves, so be selfish in loving yourself. It's all right to be a little selfish. Hello? Quiet in this Presbyterian church tonight. It's all right to be a little selfish in loving yourself. So be selfish in loving yourself and be kind to yourself. Don't just tolerate yourself. But delight in yourself as the Lord delighteth in you, in creating you in his image and after his likeness. Someone said, I can't love myself. Well, then you're never going to experience. See? And what is it? It's allowing the Christ, our husband, to show us the importance of depositing the seed so that we can bear fruit in the outer realm and it not just be 30 or 60, but a hundredfold fruit that remains. Religion didn't teach us this. Religion hasn't taught us this. Religion has taught us, give the shirt off your back. Religion has taught us, you better pay your tithes. One man on television, I won't mention his name, is very popular. He says, pay your tithes or God will take it out of your hide. <laughs> pay your tithes or God will take it out of your hide. Yeah. See, that's not loving ourselves. Paul said, give as you purpose in your heart. Verse 30 in the King James, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. My paraphrase is, we are his imprint. You know, uh, a man that used to come to my church and teach years ago said, When God made you, he threw away the mold. You're one of a kind. Everyone has a different mm -hmm. fingerprint. Just as every, Can you imagine every snowflake? And we are snowflakes. But every snowflake is different. So when he made us, he, he threw away the mold. mold. There's none like us, but we're still in his image. In that sense, we're all alike, but yet different. So we need to celebrate one another's uniqueness. Say it that way. We need to celebrate one another's uniqueness. And religion has taught us, oh, you got to just be like me. Believe what I believe. Dress like I dress. Eat the same kind of food, because some food, you know, of course, you don't eat on certain days of the week. So make so on Friday, none of you eat, you know, you know, whatever their rules are. Eat fish, whatever. <laughs> I had to hit that because Bill's here tonight. But now, listen, that, that's the way it is. Religion has taught us to be like little penguins. Walk the same way, talk the same way, eat the same thing, respond the same way. You know, we need to celebrate one another's uniqueness. So verse 30, and my paraphrase is, for we are his, his imprint. Everything about him is true of us. 
In fact, we are him in every respect. We are him in every respect. Almost done. A few more here. Verse 31, King James. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. My paraphrase is, just as a man in the natural leaves his own parents and is joined unto his wife in marriage, so are we. So we are one with our Creator as one identity. So leave that which man calls your natural roots, father and mother, and realize your spiritual roots. You know, when you go to the doctor, oh, what, did your mom have this? Did your dad have this? Are they still alive? Listen, our roots are in Christ. He's our heritage. Remember Melchizedek? No beginning of time, ending of days, no mother, no father. What is that depicting for us? That we need to realize, as Jesus said, you have one father. Call no man on earth your father. You have one father. Now, certainly we came out of our parents, but God gave them the power of procreation. We really evolved out of him. In a sense, we were never born. We evolved out of him. We evolved out of him. So we need to realize, he's saying here, we need to leave our father and mother thinking that our roots are in our father and mother and whatever they went through, by golly, we're going to go through and experience. No, realize that your roots are in Christ. Now, verse 32 for this is a great mystery. In other words, this that I've written, Paul is saying in this chapter, has to be discerned by the Spirit. So when it's talking about the husband and the wifey, if this is a great mystery, and if he's talking about Christ and the church, then I think we've been a little hoodwinked and bamboozled when we've tried to apply this and bring condemnation on people by saying, bless God, you better love that husband, and you better submit to that husband, and husband, you better, you know, unconditionally love that wife. It's not talking about that. It's talking about our husband Christ and our feminine principle, our awareness. If he calls it a mystery and he says he's talking about Christ in the church, then we know he can't be talking about natural marriage here. So my paraphrase of verse 32 is, the secret of this one identity is in knowing that it can never, under any circumstance, ever become separate or divided asunder. It was and is eternally one. So what is he trying to show us here? Oneness. Heaven and earth are one. We are one in our identity. And so therefore we need to bring the seeds of that oneness into our awareness so that we then can walk out of that awareness and bear the fruit of that oneness. That's all he's talking about here. Verse 33, last verse, King James, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Again, what, what are we doing? We're loving that feminine part into the union, not condemning ourselves, gifting ourselves with this extravagant love Nevertheless, Paul says in King James, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now my paraphrase of this one is probably the longest, but this is my paraphrase. Therefore, that realization that we've talked about here of what the husband and the wife really depict, that realization and knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of the Father initiates within us the automatic loving and clinging to our feminine part and the respect of our masculine part as we see the importance of impregnating our feminine part with that which is in the masculine part in order to birth the life of Christ in every facet of our lives and also in the lives of others. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That chapter, Ephesians chapter 5, is not talking about a natural marriage. It's talking about from the very get-go in verse 1, live from the inside out. Be followers of Christ as his dear children. In other words, live with the Spirit. Live from the inside out. And as we do, everything else then in the natural will eventually fall in place the way it needs to fall in place. To me, this is awesome revelation. 
if we can realize, and that's what Jesus was saying in the parable of the sower sowing the seed. If you understand this parable, you'll understand all the rest. And what was the parable? The parable was the ground that you sow the seed in is your heart or your awareness. If you understand that the most important thing in your life is to get the masculine and the feminine going in the same direction, realizing they already are one, you're not trying to become one, but if you want to walk out experientially that oneness, then you've got to sow that sperm the sperma, the Greek word for seed, has to be sown into the womb, as Peter called it, of our awareness. And then listen, the birthing will just be natural. The birthing will just be spontaneous. Just like the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. He said, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the manifestation of the works of the flesh. You will just love, joy, peace. All of that will just be spontaneous. And I'm convinced that's what the Christian life is all about. Living this life effortlessly because we're living from a posture of rest. And then it just naturally will flow. Anything else is us still trying to modify our behavior. Anything else is just trying to create some doo-doo. And that's all it is, doo-doo. And it's, anything else is the same thing Adam did. He thought he could do something to become like God when he already was in his image and after his likeness. And you can see how far that got him. Not very far. It got him to just simply embrace death, and that death eventually manifested completely and totally within his physical body. So whatever we put in the computer, what you put in the computer, that's all you can get out of it. Whatever we put in the womb of our computer, the womb of our awareness, is what is going to be produced outwardly in the form of the fruit of God. And so this is why I believe Jesus in the parable of the sower sowing the seed was so explicit about, you'll understand all parables, you'll understand all things if you'll understand this. If you understand that you have it all already and you're already one, and masculine and feminine are already one, but to walk some say walk that out, but to walk in that, experience that, you've got to deposit the seed. He's not going to do it for us. We must put on the mind of Christ. We keep the garden. We do that. And it's our nature to do that, so, you know, it's our nature. That's our nature. We're not going against our nature. So he in us, that masculine principle of our being, is wanting to experientially impregnate our womb, our feminine part, so that we can just be who we've always been. We've always been. Nothing, you cannot become who you be. All you can do is wake up to who you've always been, and then through that realization, you begin to walk in it. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word tonight, for your presence. Thank you for the true teacher, the Holy Spirit, that as we contemplate and meditate, and even when we don't, can be quickened by the Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your grace, for your love, for revealing yourself unto us, for showing us that the death of Jesus exposed and absorbed the lies that we've been told, and your resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, Reveal the truth of being unto us. We thank you for that tonight. We bless you. We honor you. We love you because you first loved us. In the name of the Lord, amen, amen, and amen.